Hello, and welcome to the session. Today, we're going to be talking about the recent performance enhancements that we've made to Amazon Elastic File System, also known as Amazon EFS. My name is Priya Chakravarti, and I'm a product manager in the EFS service team. I'm joined today by my colleague, Kjord Jansen, who is also a product manager in the same team. Before we step into the session, here are a list of other sessions that go into Amazon EFS in this reInvent session. There's a two, there are two 200 level sessions on AWS storage solutions for containers and serverless applications. Then you can choose to deep dive into developing serverless application using Amazon EFS or persistent storage using containers using Amazon EFS. We have two 400 level sessions, one about getting the most out of your Amazon EFS deployments and another about optimizing EFS performance best practices. As I walk through the slides of this session, I'll be speaking about additional details and which session to attend to get additional details on any topic that I'm highlighting. In the spirit of jumping right in, we'll begin the session with an introduction to what Amazon Elastic File System is. Next, we'll talk about the recent performance optimizations that we've launched with Amazon Elastic File Systems, both as features, AWS features that we launched publicly, and also features that we launched silently to customers. Then we'll talk about a number of applications and how they will be benefiting from these performance enhancements. Then we'll take a small segue into performance best practices. And finally, I'll summarize. <coughs> Introduction to Amazon EFS. Before we talk about any AWS service, it makes sense to talk about what customers are using it for and who is really using it. When we look at what customers are doing on AWS, we see three major trends that are emerging. Customers are migrating existing on-prem workloads or applications to AWS, and they're also moving their data along with it. Customers are modernizing their existing application, either with, if the application is on-prem or the application is running in AWS in EC2 instances. And I'm talking about modernization, essentially what customers are doing are they're using or uh, in a latest uh, compute models, replacing it with Lambda or container applications, or what they could be doing is they are actually substituting self-managed databases or storage solutions with uh, fully managed AWS solutions. Thirdly, customers could be building cloud-native applications on AWS using cloud-native AWS compute and cloud-native AWS storage tools. When you think about these three categories, the one common thread that intersects, one of the common thread that intersects all three categories of application is data. And when you talk about data, quite a lot of that data out there is file data. A majority of, the majority of applications running right now, traditional applications running right now use file data. So migra when you're talking about migration, file data is really important, or files, is, you know, file-based storage is really important. But I think what may not be so, e so, so obvious is the fact that file storage and file systems are important in the other two buckets of categories as well, in the modernization bucket and in the new applications bucket. What we see in the modernization bucket a lot is customers actually <coughs> you know, using AWS solutions and modernizing their applications and you, uh, containerizing it and turning it into a containerized architecture. And they may be replacing a self-managed NFS server, 
with Amazon EFS. When we're talking about building and deploying brand new applications that are cloud native, customers typically use EFS for machine learning applications or analytics, and that's something that we've observed. This is because a lot of the existing machine learning frameworks that are out there actually use file storage. And machine learning advocates and developers are familiar and very comfortable file-based workloads. What is Amazon Elastic File System really? We launched EFS in 2016 to give customers a cost-optimized, performant, and cloud-native file storage or file system. From a cost-optimization perspective, EFS provides four storage classes. And these storage classes come with automatic lifecycle management that allows for data to be moved between performance-optimized and cost-optimized storage classes. These storage classes also comes with EFS intelligent Turing that is used to optimize cost for workloads with unknown or changing access patterns. Now, if we use EFS one zone as a baseline, and then we use the industry <coughs> average of 20% of all data being hot and 80% of data being cold, then the price of EFS is effectively 4.3 cents per gigabyte per month. Now, about performance. EFS is performant, providing latencies as low as one millisecond, up to 35K to 500K IOPS, and up to five to 10 gigabytes per second of throughput. EFS is also cloud native. And what do I mean by that? I mean that EFS requires no management it is elastic in that you only pay for the bytes that you're actually storing. And, it's, and it can scale to tens of terabytes of storage with no pre-provisioning required. EFS uses cloud-native security and is integrated with AWS identity and access management and uses resource policies for, for restricting or controlling access to your file system. EFS is integrated with AWS key services to essentially provide data at rest encryption. And it also provides customers with customer managed keys, should the customer so prefer. Likewise, EFS also supports encryption in flight through the EFS utils package with no additional configuration at all. EFS is integrated with all the existing compute models in AWS today, and these include EC2, Amazon ECS, EFS Fargate, EF, uh, AWS Fargate, AWS Lambda, AWS Batch, and Amazon SageMate. <clears throat> EFS is highly durable and highly available. When I talk about durability, it's designed for 11 nines of durability, and both one zone and standard storage classes are designed for 11 nines of durability. From an availability perspective, the one zone storage classes support an SLA of three nines of available, uh, availability, and the standard storage classes support an SLA of four nines of availability. Now that we've discussed what EFS really is, let's discuss some of the common use cases that we can use EFS for that are popular in EFS. Now, EFS is a cloud native file storage that's designed for the majority of file-based workloads. And because we're talking about a majority of file-based workloads, they include workloads with a variety of performance characteristics. Now, these could be applications that are single-threaded, that have very low latency requirements, or they could be highly parallel, uh, you know, scale out jobs like uh, you know, machine learning workloads or analytics workloads or big data workloads that need a really lot, lot of throughput. 
Now let's look at some of the use cases that we see are, are, are run on EFS. First, simplification and centralization of DevOps is a common use case that we see in EFS. And these are code repositories, CI-CD pipeline, and issue tracking systems. And common examples of applications in this category are uh, Jenkins, Confluence, or Git. Then there's web serving and content management applications that run on EFS. And these include applications that create and modify digital assets on EFS. Examples could be uh, WordPress, Drupal, or Moodle. Next, data science and analytics workload run on EFS frequently. EFS enables customers to accelerate the data insights and to run inferences and analysis on uh, EFS faster. Examples of applications in this category are um, Airflow, or TensorFlow, or Informatica. Next, media processing application, including image processing and video hosting. EFS is also used as a secondary storage for database backup applications like Oracle, Cassandra, MongoDB, etc., etc. Finally, last but not the least, EFS is used for modern application development. And what I mean by that is customers can use EFS to provide persistent storage for their modern application that uses containers or Lambda, but they can also use EFS to move or migrate existing applications, enterprise applications to AWS and modernize at their own pace. Now that we've spoken about what EFS is and the use cases that run on EFS, let's talk about the performance optimizations that we've done on EFS. We at EFS are extremely focused on performance because customers have told us that performance is really important to them. And in the next section, we're gonna be discussing some of the recent performance improvements we've launched since 2020. Taking a step back about storage performance, when we talk about storage performance, we're basically talking about three cardinal dimensions, the throughput, the IOPS, and the latency. IOPS is essentially the number, uh, is, is the, request, the amount of, number of requests the storage subsystem can handle. Now this, you know, what this means could differ based on the storage subsystem. So if you're talking about block storage, IOPS could mean the number of reads and writes to a, 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 a unit called a block. When you're talking about files, IOPS is the number of requests that can be handled by a, a set of files that you're reading or writing from. With respect to throughput, throughput is the number of bytes per second that can be sent, uh, you know, uh, sent out or uh, uh, written to the uh, storage subsystem. Latency is essentially the average response time, and that's measured in millisecond and microseconds. But these three dimensions of storage are related to each other. They are not independent of each other. For instance, IOPS and throughput are related to each other through the IO size. Another way to describe this is, let's say you're pushing a certain number of IOPS to the storage subsystem, and you're doing it at a certain IO size then that allows you to achieve a certain throughput. There's also a relationship between IOPS and latency. IOPS and latency are related through the average queue depth. You may know this as Little's Law. And uh, yeah, when we're talking about file storage, things get a little bit complicated because the latencies depend on the uh, you know, operation that's performed, and every operation can have a different latency. Because these three dimensions are related to each other, usually storage vendors, when they're publishing performance metric, they try, they, 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 they publish one metric and keep the other two constant. For instance, 
when you're talking about latency, you're usually measured at a lower IOP and uh, I'm sorry, at a lower uh, IO size and Q depth. When you're talking about throughput, it's usually measured at a slightly higher IO depth and Q depth, uh, IO size and Q depth. With respect to IOPS, it's usually measured at a slightly higher Q depth and low uh, IO size. Now, as we walk through the slides in today's presentation, we'll footnote what IO size and, and um, Q depth that we based our measurements on. I've been promising to speak about the uh, latest performance improvements we've done. And since 2020, we've launched a lot of performance improvements either publicly or we've launched them you know, quietly into the, uh, into the source code for customers to uh, benefit from. In April, on April 1st, 2020, we increased the read IOPS for general purpose file systems from 7,000 to 35,000 representing a 5x improve, improvement in IOPS. W what this means is that overnight, applications like analytics application or applications that are read heavy like uh, you know, de developer uh, to, uh, tools, these applications saw a overnight increase in performance without having to take in any configuration and entirely free of cost. This was a big hit with our customers. Next. On July 23rd, we increased the per, per, per client throughput from 250 megabytes per second to 500 megabytes per second. Again, overnight, customers were able to drive two times the number of through, uh, twice the number of through, throughput from a single NFS client. And this benefited database applications that could, were single-threaded and were, uh, you know, could get more uh, throughput into their uh, into their backups. In Jan of this year, we tripled the read throughput. What this means is that you could be provisioned for a one gigabyte per second, but you could achieve up to three gigabytes per second of read throughput. So we're in regions where we support one gigabyte per second of maximum throughput to a file system, we support up to three gigabytes per second of read throughput. And if you, your file system is in a region that supports a maximum of three gigabytes per second, then you can go all the way up to five gigabytes per second of read throughput. So these were some of the performance improvements <laughs> that we launched since the beginning of 2020. Now when I spoke to you a little bit earlier, I spoke about three dimensions. And just now, I spoke to you, uh, you know, I presented to you three enhancements we did, but they covered IOPS and they covered throughput. So what may be going on in your head is, what about latency? What has EFS done about latency? To answer that question, I'm going to call my friend and colleague, Jörg Jansen, to uh, describe to you what we've done from a latency perspective. Thank you, Priya. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about latency. Um, so why is latency important? Well, you know, a lot of applications really benefit from low latency. So this could be, you know, content management applications like WordPress or Drupal, you know, Confluence. Could be devil applications like Git or Jenkins, you know, machine learning, home directories, you, know, you name it. Typically any application or especially applications using smaller files, they can really benefit from, from lower latencies. And our customers are very clear about, you know, latencies is important to us. So what have we done for latencies? Um, now, one thing is on March 9th of 2021, so this year, we introduced the EFS One Zone storage class. Now, EFS One Zone is a highly available and highly durable file system that replicates data within a single availability zone. And on average, the EFS1 zone provides a 35% lower per operation latency than EFS standard. Now, after we launched one zone, a lot of customers were very excited about this, and they've adopted it for a wide range of use cases, like the ones I just mentioned. 
Um, but that's not all. So in addition to launching uh, one zone, so both before, during, and after the one zone launch, we've been hard at work to provide optimizations for our customers that reduce latency, in particular for the general purpose performance mode. Um, so since early 2020, we've launched more than 20 optimizations that reduce latency um, and made those available to our customers. All of those were available free of charge and all except one were made available overnight with no action requirement required for customers um, and made available transparently. So, and you know, the cumulative result of these performance optimizations has been that the latency for key operations, and we'll give a couple of examples later, has been reduced between two and four X. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about storage classes first, and then we'll talk about these individual optimizations that we've done. Um, so as Priya already mentioned, you know, we have four storage classes. The one that we launched with is EFS standard. Uh, EFS standard is a highly durable, highly available file system that replicates data across multiple availability zones. Um, as we mentioned, with lifecycle management and the industry standard ratio between cold and, and warm data, the cost of EFS standard is eight cents per gigabyte month. Read latencies are between one and 2.4 milliseconds. Write latencies are between 3.6 and 11.5 11, 11 milliseconds. Now, these latencies represent um, average latencies for read and writes of both metadata and 4K data operations. Um, so the first number, the 1.0 and 2.4, is a 2x reduction since last reInvent, since you know the last virtual reInvent when everybody was behind their screen watching our presentations. And the write latencies represent a you know between 10% and 4x improvement. And you know this is a wide range, so I'm gonna give a little bit more detail in a bit. Okay. So that's EFS standard. Let's contrast that with EFS one zone. So just like standard, one zone is a highly available and highly durable file system that replicates data within a single availability zone. Um, using lifecycle management and again, the same standard ratios, the cost for one zone storage is 4.3 cents per gigabyte month. Read latencies are between one and 1.5 milliseconds and write latencies are between 2.4 and 7.4 milliseconds. So again, as we've mentioned, the um, EFS one zone latencies are 35% lower on average than the standard latencies and at a 47% lower cost. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about some of those optimizations then that we spoke about, some of those 20 optimizations that we've uh, made available to customers um, transparently. And we'll do that by looking at a couple of common operations. So the first one I want to talk about is open. Um, so in the graph here, you see the latency for a particular type of open operation. It's called open with claim of age, but what it means is an open operation where the file handle is already, or the file name has already been looked up to a file handle. Um, and this represents over 90% of, of open operations. So very representative. Um, the blue line, sorry, the green line is the one zone latency and the orange line is the standard latency. And as you can see, since January of this year, the latency was reduced from about 2000 milliseconds to slightly under one millisecond today. And this represents a two X improvement. Now, wh why is open so interesting? Um, you know, open is a very prevalent operation on NFS. And in fact, it's, it's up to four times more prevalent than read. Now, why is that? You might ask yourself, like our application just opening files and then not doing anything with that file. Uh, in fact, that, that's, that's what happens. Um, the reason is that NFS clients, they cache data. And so, you know, if the cache is up to date, the read will actually serve from cache. But what the open operation does is actually two things. Number one, it gives, you know, the file handle to the operating system. But number two, it also serves as a cache consistency check. So when you open a file, it will typically always be in an open to the NFS server. Um, and then, you know, that, that has some kind of verifier with it that can validate the local cache. And then if data is cached after the open, that will be served from the local cache. And so you wouldn't see it on the network. 
this make open this makes open a particularly important operation uh, for, from a latency perspective. Very, because it's so pre prevalent, it's very important to have low latency. Um, and what use cases benefit from this? Uh, pretty much any use case that reads lots and lots of files, um, lots and lots of different files, you know, typically small files. So think about, again, content management, you know, WordPress, Drupal, um, Confluence, Moodle, other kinds of applications. Um, ML inferencing and even training fall into this category where you're opening a lots and lots of small files and where you really want that open latency to be as slow as possible. Okay, let's look at another um, important operation, and in this case, write. You know, write obviously is kind of important because it's the only way to actually add data to your file system. Um, in the graph here, again, two lines. In this case, the latency is plotted for writes for small files, which is the green line, and the write latency for large files, which is the orange line. Um, the latency here is actually for a 16 kilobyte write operation. The table is for a four kilobyte. There, there's a reason for that. Don't need to go into that right now. Um, so that's why the numbers don't totally line up. Um, but yeah, what you can see is that, um, you know, around the same time this time, this year, sorry, uh, same time of year last year, you know, at, at last reInvent, around you know, November, December time frame, the latency for small file writes reduced from around 15 milliseconds to about five milliseconds. Um, and then it, you know, it went down further from that. Now, why, why are we like, making this distinction here between small file latencies and, and large file latencies? Well, actually, that is because <clears throat> small file write latencies are very important. Um, if you look at the files that are stored on EFS today, about 80% of those files are small. And with small, in this case, we mean less than 64 kilobytes. Um, so they're very, very numerous. In addition to you know, being the majority of files being small, um, applications that use small files are also very sensitive to latencies. Um, this is because you know, when you read a file or write a file, and when that file is small, you're naturally reading only a small amount of data. Um, if you read and write or write a large file, you're typically writing at large block sizes. So in NFS, it's up to one megabyte. And if you're reading very large files, you know, other things happen where the NFS client will either read ahead or do write back, does write back caching for writes. And those cause those reads and writes to be issued at a higher IO depth, in, in essence, in parallel which further sort of reduce the latency sensitivity of those applications. So it's, it's quite, quite interesting that, you know, if you look at large file versus small file workloads, it's really the sort of two camps. One is very latency sensitive, um, you know, and not very throughput, uh, throughput sensitive. The other, you know, use case is, is, is much less latency sensitive, but more sensitive to throughput. And that's why EFS handles those uh, differently uh, for now. And so the net net of that is that you know, that 15 milliseconds, which we had around November, December timeframe last year, um, is now 2.4 milliseconds for small files on one zone to 7.4 for large files on one zone, 3.6 for small files on standard, and then up to 11.5 for large files on standard. Now, what use cases benefit from this? Um, so the usual suspects, any use case that creates all the small files, uh, you know, Git and Jenkins for DevOps, um, in data science, uh, you know, things like Jupyter, you know, data scientists running, you know, workload notebooks in, in Jupyter. Uh, Conda is another notable example where you create like Python environments. Um, so yeah, those, those use cases, they benefit a lot from these optimizations. So let's have a look at that then. Um, let's look at a number of applications and how these sort of operation level latencies are benefiting uh, uh, actual applications. Um, the first time, the first one I want to talk about is, is Git. It's sort of a favorite um, application of mine. And what the graph shows here is the time it takes to do a Git clone of the Linux kernel. In this case, it's the Linux 5.3 kernel onto an EFS file system. And you know we've been tracking this workload for a while. So the graph shows the, the runtime of this workload all the way from January of 2020 up to you know when I made the slides two weeks ago or so. Um, just before we started this optimization, we took a baseline. 
Base time was about 2300 seconds, which is a little over 38 minutes. Um, now, over time, this went down, and today for standard latency is around 700 seconds, which is, I believe, a little bit under 12 minutes. And then for one zone, it's about 500 seconds, which is a little over eight minutes. So this is an up to 4.5x improvement uh, that we achieved, you know, over the last uh, over the last two years. Um, I will say that that Git clone, um, is, you know, the, first of all, I will say that the Linux kernel is one of the largest software projects out there, um, <clears throat> and so this represents like a P100 workload. So very likely, you know, if you're using this, your runtimes will be a lot smaller than what is mentioned here. Second. You know, not all developers, uh, or typically developers, do not check out Git onto their local store, or, or sorry, onto a network file system. Typically, they check out onto local storage. Um, but CI systems, for example, they, they they do often check out on um, you know on, on network storage. So, you know, however you use Git, it is a nice workload or nice workbench, and it's also kind of used as a de facto sort of test for for testing network file systems. So yeah, up to 4.5x over the last two years. So let's look at another workload, uh, WordPress. Again, very widely in use and also representative for a large amount of applications. Um, so this graph contains the uh, page load time for a very simple WordPress uh, installation. So basically took WordPress, uh, moved the document route to EFS, um, and created a Hello World blog post. Um, we measure the latency over time, and, and these are the results. So not, not every customer or not every hosting provider will run WordPress in this way, uh, but some of them do. And in any case, it's sort of a general and, and good benchmark for application that reads a lot of small files. And so what you can see, the latency or the pace load time for this specific workload went down from about, actually a little bit over 1,000 milliseconds um, in January this year to about 500 milliseconds uh, today, which is a 2x improvement. Okay, so we spoke about um, the operations that we've improved. We spoke about application impact. Just wanna call out two of our reference customers and how they use EFS and how their use cases benefit uh, from these improvements. So the first customer that I wanna call out is Acquia. Uh, they are in the hosting business. They have a Drupal-based web hosting service, and they um, recently modernized their offering based on EKS and EFS. Uh, so this allowed them to be more nimble, um, so they can reduce their operational overhead at the same time have a better customer experience because they can dynamically scale out their environment. So the fact that everything is on EFS. You know, allows them to have this shared view across their application nodes of these web, web, uh, web, uh, web content, and just allows them to scale out uh, the, the the compute servers uh, on EKS to have like a dynamically scalable environment for their customers. And so the improvements that we spoke about earlier, they benefit use cases like these, like like this customer. The other one I want to briefly call out is, I think, a very interesting use case, Asurion. So Asurion um, is in the business of selling service contracts to consumers for electronics. Um, and they're using uh, EFS and AWS Lambda to do ML inferencing. Um, so being in sort of consumer business, um, customer service is very important to Asurion. And um, so what they're doing is they're doing ML on records or transcripts, no, actually uh, recordings of, um, of phone calls. And so they do this to make sure that their experts uh, you know, are engaged and you know, are, are working well with, with their customers. Um, because the call volume during the day changes um, naturally and the customer wanted to do this in an on-demand model where they pay as you go, they didn't want to provision infrastructure. And so they wanted to use this or run this use case on AWS Lambda um, and sort of have this pay-as-you-go model. But the recordings for these phone calls were larger than what fit in the Lambda sandbox. And so they're using EFS to store these recordings. And then they can access them from any Lambda function, do the ML inference, pay-as-you-go, 
And uh, yeah, that will ensure a, cu uh, a good customer experience for, for their customers. Um, and again, use cases like these greatly benefit from the operation, from the optimization that we've done you know, around Open and others. Okay, so I want to close this session by giving a couple of best practices. So what we spoke about before is sort of what EFS has done to improve performance. There's a couple of things that customers can do, that, that you can do as well, just to make sure you've got you know, the right level of performance from EFS. Uh, this is actually a summary of another talk that I'll be doing later in the week. It's actually a chalk talk, STG403. Um, I believe it is on Thursday. So if you're interested in that, please uh, please come and see that talk as well. But yeah, the summary of those uh, of that talk is, is on this slide. So there are seven best practices that I want to briefly run through uh, just to make sure that you have optimal performance for, for EFS. Um, actually, many of these are not specific to EFS even. It's more like NFS, general best practices, but they work for EFS as well. Um, first of them, that one is actually EFS specific, is to use a general purpose performance mode. Um, general purpose gives you the lowest latency and is the right performance mode for 90% or more of applications. EFS also has a MaxAO performance mode, which is more of a scale out workloads. Um, MaxAO has more IOPS than GP, um, but it has higher per operation latencies, especially for metadata. So that's why we recommend using the general purpose performance mode and it's, you know, the best mode for, for over 90% of applications. Number two, um, making sure you have sufficient burst credits or use provision throughput. The EFS has two, uh, sorry, two throughput modes. One is the bursting mode and one is the provision mode. In bursting mode, you have what's called a base rate and a bursting rate. Bursting rate is higher than the base rate and as long as you have burst credits, you can uh, drive throughput at the bursting rate. So it's important to make sure you don't run out of credits. Now for workloads that are using a lot of throughputs and don't have a lot of storage, um, the provision throughputs might be the best option because they might not accrue enough burst credits and therefore might run out and therefore you know, switching to provision make sure you have enough throughput always. Number three, um, use EFS one zone for workloads that, that, uh, that are in a single zone. Right, if you have a workload that is in a single zone and you don't require multi-AZ replication, um, EFS one zone is a good fit for you because you get 35% lower latencies and you get 40% lower cost. Number four, uh, use the mount helper. Um, EFS provides a small utility that you can use to mount your file system. In the back, it's still using the NFS protocol. So just make sure that when we mount the file system, we configure the operating system in the right way and use the right mount options. Speaking of mount options, um, we recommend just using the default options. Um, the mount helper makes that easy to do. Uh, the mount helper still allows you to specify additional options and the recommendation is pretty much don't do that. Um, there's a couple of options that customers sometimes want to tweak um, and they are here in the do not use part. So things like no AC sync and a couple of variations of lookup cache. Um, these options disable part of the caching that is being done by the NFS clients. Um, and they can have detrimental effects on performance. Now, sometimes customers, um, they, they want to use it because the NFS caching behavior is not always um, super transparent. It is actually well-defined what the client does, but it's not always known to customers how data and metadata is actually cached by the NFS clients. So sometimes customers experience like unknown things, like they see things on certain instances but not on others, um, and, and then they try some of these options. Um, that is not recommended. It's actually recommended to get an understanding of how NFS caching works and then work with the caching rather than against it by trying to disable it. And this is also a key thing I'm gonna discuss in my, my auto talk, the SCG 403. Okay, number six is use a recent version of the operating system. Um, the NFS client has improved a lot and continues to improve a lot um, in the upstream Linux kernel community. So if you wanna use that latest NFS client you need to use a new version of the operating system because it basically gets shipped together with the kernel. 
So good operating systems are Amazon Linux 1, RHEL 7.3, Ubuntu 16.04. Uh, better ones are Amazon Linux 2 or higher, RHEL 8 or higher, Ubuntu 18.04 or higher. And then uh, finally, unless you really know how your application uses directories, it's better to keep directories to a relatively modest size or by 10,000 or so. Um, there are customers that use much larger directories. We have a couple of customers using billions of files in a directory. Um, the reason that's not recommended is there are certain operations, um, notably listing directories, for example, that um, become slower when the directory gets larger. And so if your application does, for example, a list directory often, you know, that gets basically linear in the time or in this linear with the size of the directory. Um, so unless you really know how your application works and how it uses directories, keeping it to less than 10,000 will pretty much ensure that, that no bad things happen and that you get the best performance. Okay, so a summary. Um, we continuously innovate on performance and we roll out many changes that benefit customers. Number two, we've improved uh, the, we improve the performance for key use cases by between 2 and 4.5x. Number three, the OneZone storage class offers a 35% lower latency at a 47% lower cost. And number four, uh, please check back frequently. Performance is very important to us, and so we're continuously working on this. We have multiple things in the pipelines, so stay tuned. Um, with that, I want to thank you, and we'll be around here if there's any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you.